All right, let's try that again. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody's good. I know some of you caught the tail end of the rain, but I am certainly glad we're getting it. I know my yard needed it. I was telling somebody it's much cheaper if God waters it than when I water it, so I prefer him doing it. But <laughs> hey, Kurt, will you get those doors for me, please? Thank you. All righty, let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for you, to you for this day, Father. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here this evening and thank you for, for uh, the safe journey for everyone here tonight. We certainly pray for those who are on their way as well, that you'll watch over them and provide them with safe journey. And Father, it's always a privilege when we can study your word and certainly to learn how to be um, better Christians and better uh, disciples of yours. And Father, we pray as we study those things tonight that we have open hearts and open minds as we can take those things in and certainly adjust where we need to in our lives and improve what it means to be part of your kingdom and your family and father we pray that we strive towards that end father we're certainly grateful for everyone present tonight we're thankful for our bible class teachers and their study in this effort as we begin this new quarter and we're grateful for them for our students as well father and pray that you'll watch over them and bless them and Father, we pray certainly all that we do here at Cary, not only in our classes, but in our worship and and what we do uh, every day as your children, we strive to honor and glorify you. Father, we thank you so much for our family here at Cary, for the blessings that we enjoy because of what you've given us. We thank you for uh, the unity and love that we share here and pray that continues to abound. We certainly pray for our leadership as they uh, help to guide us to eternity. uh, But Father, we also pray that uh, we can provide for those needs that they have as as our leaders and certainly that uh, we need to lift them up and and provide them and help them to be strong and certainly courageous in the world in which we live today and the difficulties they're having to face and certainly sometimes the decisions and we're thankful for for their hearts and certainly their love for us as well as their family and the sacrifice that they offer. Father, we're also very grateful for our deacons, uh, the many wonderful works that they do and many times those works aren't seen but we're thankful for their effort and love for us as well as they Uh, strive in every area of of the congregation that the elders see there's a need and we pray that you'll bless them and give them strength and courage to do their jobs and their families as well and father help us to all be unified together as we put our hands to the plow father we always want to lift up before you those among us especially the household of faith who are struggling at this time and we're struggling emotionally or maybe it's spiritually and certainly physically and those who are going through surgeries and recoveries and Pray that you'll be with Brother Gene as he recovers uh, as well, Father. We're thankful that he's home from the hospital and pray that he'll continue to improve and gain strength and that you'll also be with Sister Carol as well. Father, we're mindful of our missionaries abroad and we pray for them and the efforts in which they do and those things that they um, sacrifice as well. And pray that you'll be with Ella as she's concluding her trip and be with that whole group as they come back in a few days. And we pray for their safety and their travel. And Father, we're just so grateful for the many men and women who serve overseas and abroad, who preach your word in many difficult areas, and we're thankful most of all for their love for you and for your son. Father, again, walk with us now as we go through this class, but most of all, we thank you for Jesus and certainly for his sacrifice, and we know that all blessings come through him. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. All righty, so we begin our new quarter. We're going to be looking at Created for Good Works. Um, and kind of as we talk about this, this comes from Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But really kind of what we want to talk about is tonight is what's our divine purpose as we think about what it means to be created for good works. And so when we think about this idea of, of purpose, we understand what our responsibility is as a Christian, first and foremost, that we should be glorifying God. And everything that we do brings glorification to God. So... We also understand that we have a great responsibility concerning evangelizing the world, that that's not, you know, it's not something with which we get to choose. God is giving a command as he talks about in Matthew chapter 28, where he says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we understand that responsibility, but really when you think about it, what is our purpose 
as Christians? We understand our duties, but what do you think our purpose is as Christians? Anybody? Okay. Give glory to Jesus Christ. Purpose, it, you know, to define purpose, purpose really in, in, in the context of the spiritual concept that I'm, that I'm looking for tonight, purpose is, is really the, the, the God-given purpose for our existence. What has God designed us to do? Obviously, as, as he just you know, mentioned, we are, you know, as I talked about, giving glory to God. But within the context of giving glory to God, how do we do that? Go ahead. Okay. Bear, he said, bear his image. I thought somebody else had their hand up. So when you think about what it means, especially when you think about from the, from the mindset of, of divine, our divine purpose... We have a God-given purpose for our existence. And that God-given purpose is for that, that for which we've been created. And Paul was talking about this to the Ephesian church. As he gets into in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is kind of really expressing this idea to the church as they were growing and as he's continuing to expound upon their purpose in relation to the gospel and how they were supposed to share those things. He said, you also have to be mindful of what God created you to do as we are glorifying God, as he mentioned in some of the other things. Our purpose in relation to how we're glorifying God is what's going to also shine for the world to see in who we are. Now, we talked about Sunday talking about our influence as Christians. And we influence people in many different ways. But we also have a purpose as it relates to our influence to the world. So notice what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. So let me pause there for just a moment. We understand, as Paul is talking here, that we know that there's nothing that we can do to merit our own salvation. You're not going to be able to do all of these great things, and, and God's going to say, you know what, good job, well, you know what, you're in heaven. We know what, you haven't done enough work, so you're out. We know that's not the way God's grace works. We think about grace as the extension of, or a gift of something which God gives to us that we don't earn and something that we don't deserve. And so God expresses that through Jesus Christ as he commended his love towards us even when we were sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 and verse 8. So when we understand that God is extending this to us concerning this free gift, there's nothing that we can do concerning what Paul is now going to address these good works. Now, he just said, you're not saved of yourself, and works certainly don't prove that you're saved. But there is a purpose for which we have to work because God created us not just, just to exist once he saves us. God created us to be an extension of him in the kingdom that we might bring people in. And that's done through the influence, but it's also done through the good works that Paul expresses when he talks about lest anyone should boast. So you can't say, look at the, the good things I've done, for we are his workmanship. So when we think about that, as he just mentioned, we're created in his image. We are to glorify the image of God and the way in which God has created us because he's designed us specifically for a divine purpose. That is, he says you have a job to do. You don't just get to sit back and think that you're saved by faith only. You don't just get to sit back and think you have this free ticket into heaven because that's not the way this works. So for us to say, well, I'm not saved by works, but I'm saved by faith through obedience and what God is, is giving me concerning a gift, those that say that's enough are not going to make it to heaven because you are a direct extension of that which God requires you to do. If you think about being evangelist for the gospel of Christ, that's a work that God is requiring us to do. It's, it's, not, it's not something that we can omit. It's not a choice that we have. Jesus said when he said go, he was giving a direct command and an imperative that means to continue on going to share the gospel with those that are lost. And so we understand that's our responsibility. He says, for we as workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that's a continuing thing that Paul expresses. Those good works continue to go forward. So again, I'm not doing these things to save myself. I'm doing these things to show God that I appreciate and certainly love and know what he did for me at Calvary meant something and was a sacrifice. Mike, go ahead.
Yeah, Mike, Mike talks about, you know, all of this God created beforehand and put this into play even before he brought us into existence of what our responsibility was going to be. And so when you think about our God-given purpose, we also have to ensure when we think about being created for good works means the things that we do, that it doesn't become a self-driven purpose and that self doesn't get in the way of what that God-given purpose is as far as doing good works for the kingdom of God. So as long as we're not expressing this idea of all the time that's going to derail our purpose as being Christians, sometimes we can do this without realizing that we get into a me-driven purpose rather than a God-given purpose, and that I think that the things in which I need to do, as long as these things are going to benefit me, then it's something in, in which I want to accomplish. But once we become a Christian, we understand that it becomes a a selfless kind of, uh, you know, a selfless lifestyle, so to speak, and how we're going to serve God. And so kind of the me mindset has to, to be put aside. You hear it all the time. You know, you hear things like, you know, I, I want it to be this way in worship, and I want us to sing these types of songs, and I want us to do the Lord's Supper at the beginning of worship and not at the end of service, and I want, I want, I want, and I want. Well, then it becomes me-driven, self-driven, and it becomes selfish in relation to what a person wants because the, I, the problem is, is that people stop looking at the divine purpose of the church and they begin to look at the self-driven purpose of the person. And you become selfish that way and you forget what the ultimate purpose is and that's bringing glory to God. And so within the context of what our purpose is, if we're not bringing glory to God, then we're not filling our divine purpose of being created for good works. And that it's a continual effort. And so Paul distinctly says that God created people for the purpose of good works, meaning that since we're his workmanship, that God created us because we've experienced this new creation. Romans 6, 3, and 4 means we've experienced this transformation of putting away the old person and developing into the new person that God has now given us to be. And that's a continual effort. It's a continual process. It doesn't stop once we become Christians and put on Christ in baptism, there's no more work for us. Now when he says that we should continue to walk in those things, we're moving forward with what that God-given and that divine purpose is. So good works really define the life of a Christian. So let's, let's kind of think about it this way. If, if you stand before God in judgment, we think back to what Paul says, for all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for those things that they've done in their body, whether those things be what? Good or bad? What's Paul talking about there? So we're going to be judged for our works in relation to what our divine purpose and calling has been for what we're, going to, what we're doing for God. Again, I don't get to stand before God, and, and I don't see God as, as having this list and going, okay, Larry, well, you did this good, and you did this good, and you did this good, and you did this good. And I'm not looking for that kind of pat on the back from anybody either. But God's going to say, I created you to be a workman for my kingdom, and you fulfilled that responsibility. And it's not a checklist. It's not that we get up every day and say, okay, what good thing can I do today? Let me check off my little calendar to make sure that I got my good deed done for the day, so therefore I feel good about myself. If that's the way that we're approaching good works, it's the wrong way. And so it becomes something in which we learn to sacrifice. So let me make this comment. All sacrifice is not always sacrificial. You know what I mean by that? Meaning, when I sacrifice something or give up time and I'm sacrificing something, or I'm giving up money in relation to sacrificing something. If I, if I buy a car for someone who's in need, and, and you know, I'm taking, let's say I take this $8,000 in my savings account, and I'm going to purchase this thing that I want, and I see someone in need, so I turn away and say, you know what, there's somebody in the church that needs this car, so I'm going to buy them this car. That money to me really doesn't matter. This person needs it more. And so obviously you would say, that, that's, a good, that's a good chunk of change. That's a sacrifice. 
And so you think of that as a sacrifice. Well, let's say the next time it rolls around and someone needs a car or someone needs something that's going to cost you a couple of thousand dollars and you happen to have the money. And so you give it and say, you know what? I can deal with this. I'm going to give it to them. The next time, maybe perhaps it's not as hard. So what once was a sacrifice is no longer a sacrifice because it doesn't, you, it doesn't require as much effort to do it because you're doing it based upon, and it, habit's a bad term to use there. You're doing it because you understand that you're created in the image of God to bear good works for Him, and so you do this simply out of love, and it no longer seems as a sacrifice to do those things. So when I say that sacrifice is not always sacrificial, meaning that once you continue to, to do those good works, as you're doing these things, they become second nature to you, and they don't seem like a sacrifice anymore. And so now you're continuing in those works to create good works for God for the purpose of glorifying His kingdom. And now to you, this doesn't seem like a sacrifice. You're doing it because you want to be a workman for the kingdom of God, not to be seen of men, but because you know it's going to bring glory to God. So that's our divine purpose and what it means to be created for those, that purpose. So when you think about God's goodness, is God's goodness something that should drive us to do good works? You hear people say this all the time. God is good. I've heard people say that, you know, after, after losing a loved one, you know, or, or I've heard people say that after losing a, a job or a difficult financial situation where they continue to use that term, not in a, in a flippant way, not in a way that's disrespectful, but in a, an honest and sincere and pure heart that says, you know what, God is still good. You know, I might have to go through this or I might have to sacrifice or I might have to give up that which I think I want that this might be accomplished. But to me, that's not a sacrifice because I know that God is good and on the other end, God is going to continue to bless me. And so again, once we understand that sacrifice no longer becomes sacrificial, then we understand what that divine purpose is and then we say, well, the reason I do these things is because God is good. Well, how is God good? First and foremost... God was good at what He did at Calvary. And we don't use the term good in relation to being a small term. That's not, well, you know what, He's a good person, or, you know, that, that, that's a good sandwich, or something, you know, kind of minute or irreverent. We're using good in the sense of what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. And so when we think about the idea that God is good meaning that I have no problem being sacrificial in my service concerning completing good works because I know who God is. And so I use that in a way because we want to understand that God's integrity is incontestable. God is always going to hold true to what He said He's going to do in relation for us as His children concerning the good works that we're going to be created to do. Now when we think about this idea of good works... We know that God is very good. Jesus demonstrated God's goodness in numerous ways in the way that he interacted with individuals, not only in, in his healing. I think a lot of times we, we think about the, the term, I guess, goodness or good works of what Jesus was doing. Obviously, what Jesus did in healing people was absolutely good, but there was a, a huge purpose behind the miracles that he performed, number one being that he was proving who he was to mankind. There had to be a, a, a proof positive to express to people that they knew that he was no charlatan. They, they knew he was no sorcerer. They knew exactly who he was. We know that Jesus was created for a purpose. Jesus was created to save mankind. Jesus had a purpose from the very beginning concerning the creation of the earth and everything else because Jesus was there. And so when we think about the idea of Jesus demonstrating these things, we see how he reached out to the outcast of society. Jesus is the epitome of what it means to express good works to those in society that needed some type of help. But we can't minimalize, nor do we elevate the existence of good works and put them in categories. Because sometimes I think we tend to minimalize our works that we do. I'm not saying that we're braggadocious. I'm not saying that we pat ourselves on the back. But, you know, just the small things that we do that express who we are as Christians is good for the kingdom and they're considered to be good works. Mike, go ahead. This is a question. So in a category of offense, do you think that good works are just simply for our benefit or for the benefit of those who are the recipients, the recipient of those good works, or do you think it is for the purpose of further 
I think all three of them. I think, you know, obviously I think the most important is going to be for the glorifying of God and His kingdom. I think second, it's going to be to show people who we are as God's children. And I think third, I'm not saying that you, should get it, you shouldn't get anything out of it. You, you should feel good if you help someone that's in need. And I'm not saying you're going to walk into church the next day and say, Hey, Aaron, guess what I did today? You're not going to believe how many people I helped today. And I was doing all these great things. You're just not going to believe how good of a Christian I was. Then you sound like a Pharisee. You know, look at me, look at me, look at me. But rather for you to say, you know what? I feel good that I did something today for the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong with that. To know that I glorified God, and if, if somebody got to see Jesus today, even just a glimpse of who he is, then, then that's good. Then that's exactly what we want. But Mike said, you know, is it, you know, concerning the purpose of good works, is it for the kingdom? Is it for the purpose or the person to whom we're expressing or showing good works? Or is it for us, of which I think it's all three of those combined? Were you going to say something else? Yeah, Mike says if, if it's about the show and glorifying ourselves, then we know what our reward's going to be. And unfortunately, that can be the case sometimes. That can be, you know, the idea behind the way in which people express good works because they're looking for a pat on the back or they're looking to be seen or something along those lines. And so we have to, we have to be careful. And so the gospel is what illuminates the goodness of God in Christ. Look at what Paul writes concerning God's goodness in First Cor- or 2 Corinthians 4. He says, "...whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them." And so we're all a work in progress when it comes to being created, that we are God's workmanship for good works. How are we... Well, would you agree with this, this statement? We're always a work in progress. Certainly. We never get to the point where we can say we've arrived, uh, because then you never will. Uh, we, we should always be striving, as Paul says, towards making sure that we're attaining, and, and as Peter says, continuing to increase our faith that we might strengthen what we're doing for God. And so it's a continual effort there. And so Work is, is a purpose. There's a purpose to those things that we're striving to do. It's not aimless. It's not something that we're just doing. There is a purpose, but also I, I, have to, I want to be careful when I say this. We're not, do, we're not doing this to be seen, but there's a purpose concerning the work because we want to make sure that God is seen. And so, you know, we're, we're going to be really careful to, you know, if someone says, you know, I really appreciate you doing that for me, and you really sacrifice yourself, and you go, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, that was a lot. You know, well, I really had to go out of my way to do that, but I'm glad you got something out of it, but whew, man, that was a lot for me to do. But rather, what, what might a person say in relation to someone saying, you know what, I really appreciate the sacrifice that you made on my behalf. I saw that this took a lot for you to do this. What's your response should be? I give it all to God. Taking the light off me, it's not about me. Everything is about of that which I'm giving back to God that I'm pointing back to him, I'm pointing back to the cross. Again, that's, that's the divine purpose. And we're all that work in process, in progress. And we also understand that there are some people in their Christianity, and some people have been in the church a long time, who have never started that progress. Why do you think that's the case? There are some people who haven't started of what God created as a workmanship to continue, as he said, to continue in walking in those things, but have never started that process of continuing to be a workman for God concerning those good works. Why do you think that is? Now, let me, let me, say, let me state this, and then I'll get you. Let me state this. I don't want to project, nor do I want to be judgmental to say, because sometimes people do it and you don't see it. I do want to stress that. Most of the works that people do, you, you're never going to know what they're doing. Never. They'll never tell you. You'll never know. They don't want you to know. And, and that's a wonderful thing. But what I'm saying is, is addressing those who know they have done nothing in relation to working in the kingdom. Why do you think that's the case? And I think there's one, to me, there's, there's a, 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 
a huge reason why that's the case. Okay. Yeah, so Bill says, you know, we have to make sure that we're humble, that we have a humble spirit and always giving God the glory. So Mike says there's, there's some responsibility that's laid to bear in the leadership in the congregation as well. Um, and I know we've talked about this before. And I'm going to get him and then I'll get you, Stephen. Talked about this before um, as far as, you know, when, once someone's baptized, we kind of have this automatic expectation of, of, of perfection, so to speak. And they're supposed to understand really the nuances of what it means to be a Christian. And that's not the case. They're very immature. Go ahead, sir. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me reflect on that, what he said. Um, first thing he talked about was sin. You know, the devil's really good about knowing our weaknesses and snares and things like that. He talked about, uh, you know, individual lady of never forgiving herself. And we've talked about the idea of self-forgiving and trusting in the power of God's grace and, and forgiveness. And then he, you know, talked about also it's the narrative in which the world paints Jesus and making sure that we understand that it's that it's his story and again that goes back to glorifying God we always want to ensure that that we're glorifying God in all that all we do and, and kind of going back I'm sorry Stephen go ahead I don't want to forget you brother go ahead Yeah. 
Yeah, St Steve makes a good point. Um, as far as evangelism, you know, we're, we're, and I think majority of Christians are very good at evangelizing and doing good works, but sometimes we forget to put God in the front of that, making sure that we attach him to what we're doing. And, you know, kind of like James says, you left me out of the plans. So we want to ensure that, you know, hey, you know, if someone says, hey, I really appreciate that, or you went out of your way, say, look, you know, I do this because I love the Lord and I want to glorify his kingdom, and I would like to show you what that looks like. And so, again, you're not boasting in your works, but you're expressing your love for God and why you do those things because you're creating good works. So Stephen makes a good point in making sure we keep that in the forefront. And so, again, in, in talking about this idea of, of good works and why people, I think, struggle, you know, in getting stagnant or even failing to kind of launch, so to speak, or failing to thrive in that is because at the core of what you do of being created, you know, and going back to what Paul says here in, in Ephesians 2 and Greek, created in Christ Jesus for good works, you have to remember that you're doing this and it has to be based on what love is for what God did for you through Jesus. And so if that's not the, the driving force for everything that you do as a Christian and doing these things that you're going to glorify God and doing these works that his kingdom is going to be glorified, doing these things that church is going to be seeing, doing these things that Jesus is getting the credit, obviously, for all these things that we do because we're created in Christ Jesus. If we don't have the, the number one thing, and that's the love for Jesus Christ, we're never going to launch in the first place. And so your love for God and what he did for us at Calvary is what creates that divine purpose in us of why I'm willing to be sacrificial beyond all means, beyond all measures at whatever cost. Because I know that that was the same thing extended to me as a Christian from the very beginning. Jesus was sent that he died for me at all cost and gave everything that I might live free. And so I'll never be able to repay with any amount of thing that I'm going to do concerning the works for the kingdom of God. I'm never going to be able to jump up and down and say, look how good I am. I'm never going to be able to say, God, look what I did in comparing to what you did. You'll never be compared in relation to the good works or the thing in which God did. But the reason I do this is because of what God did. And so I'm not looking to, to boast. I'm not looking for the pat on the back. I don't even care if you know about the things that I do, and it's, I know it's the same for those that are Christians as far as their service to God. They do it because they love Jesus Christ. It's plain and simple. Mike, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mike said, you know, Satan's really good about making us think, well, that's good enough, you know, or, or you did your good one good deed for the month or your one good deed for the year or whatever that, that might be. But that's certainly not the case. So so what are good works? When we think about that term, we think about this idea of good works. What are good works? Again, work is purposeful. It's not aimless. So there has to be a purpose behind that, which we're doing obviously is the, the divine purpose. But the big thing is, I think, is, is seeing a need is, is the good work. And whatever that need might be, that need could be extremely small, not to make it insignificant, but that need can be small in relation to something huge. That can be small in, you know, helping someone with, with a grocery bill or something in relation to buying someone a car or opening a door for a mother who's got her hands full and at the, at the grocery store or something, or, you know, paying for someone's growth, whatever the case is, they're not aimless. There's a purpose behind everything that we do. And as long as your purpose is driven towards divine purpose concerning good works, we're not going to grade nor put those on a scale. Because when you begin to do that, and, and I've seen this happen, well, okay, I started out as a Christian and I did step one. Okay, so that means step two's got to be bigger than step one. And that means step three has got to be bigger than step one. You're not getting graded that way. You're, you know, God is not saying, well, good job on, on fulfilling your first purpose. Now your second one better be bigger than the last one or that was a waste of time. All of those small things that I might do because my talent is such are going to glorify God for his purpose. 
and those talents and those things are probably never going to be seen. You know, I used to uh, get a card from a lady until she passed away, and I didn't know who it was till after she passed away, but I used to get a card from her probably once a month, four minutes. Used to get a card from her probably once a month. She would never sign it, never knew her handwriting. Her daughter told me this after she passed away. But she would send me a card just tell me how much she loved me, how much she appreciated me, how much she you know, appreciated my sermons and my effort and all of those things. And she just said, I just want you to know that you're loved. So pat your, she always would sign it this way, pat yourself on the back today. Of course, I never did. But, but in relation to, I always appreciated that, never knew who it came from, but to me it was encouragement. Somebody's paying attention. Until after, when her daughter came up to me and said, you don't know who sent those letters, do you, do you, those cards? And I said, no. She said, that was mom. Had no idea. And she never wanted me to know while she was alive. And so to someone else, maybe that seemed significant. To me, that was like climbing Mount Everest. Because to me, it would make my day when I would get that card. And it was always the same color envelope. Different cards, same color envelope. So I knew. So those are good works. Divine purpose her, her divine purpose was in being an encourager, and she was a wonderful encourager, not only to me, but a lot of people. And so when we think about there's not an elevated manner in which we're doing these good works, as long as what I'm doing, I know that my divine purpose is because I love God and what he did for me at Calvary, that these things I know, whether it's small and encouraging someone or huge, is bringing glory to God. And that's exactly what she did. Yes, sir. In a good way? Yeah, yeah. He said we have a monopoly on encouragement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, encouragement is a huge thing. And encouraging is good works, too. You know, by you telling someone that you appreciate them or telling them you love them. And those things are good works. Even though, you know, we're expressing a sentiment and expressing a feeling, if it encourages that person or lifts them up for the day, you did a good work. And so, again, it's not about monetarily, you know, placing a, something value on what you're doing. It's about, again, glorifying the kingdom of God. Any last-minute questions or comments? We're going to close there. Anything else? All righty. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.
Good evening. If you were in the back and um, if you would take your seat, we'll begin our devotional hymn for tonight, number 883, Seek Ye First. We'll sing all three verses of this song. Seek ye first the kingdom. Good evening. Now, we uh, spent about seven years or so in Utah, and I'm still trying to get used to this, what do you call this, rain? <laughs> it's, uh, you don't get a lot of rain out there in the high desert. You get a lot of stuff that's white, but you don't get much rain. So uh, I do really appreciate this rain, and I also appreciate uh, this congregation. I don't really know how to express my gratitude for this congregation and how much you all mean to us since we came here to North Carolina and to worship with this church. When we came here, we, it was with a great sense of relief. You know, the Lord's church is going through some hard times in a lot of places in this country. and. We are so very grateful for this congregation and for your faithfulness and your stand for the truth. Now, I know many of us remember a time when we could walk into any Church of Christ and be sure of what we would see and hear. Unfortunately, today in many places, that's not the case. There are some congregations of the Lord's Church where the gospel is no longer preached, where the teaching doesn't conform to a thus saith the Lord, where worship is not in spirit and in truth. Now, some congregations no longer want to hear what you might call the same old things. They don't want the gospel. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to study from God's word. 
The Bible is ignored in favor of lessons based on things like secular books, movies, pop psychology, and primarily things such as current events. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Peter wrote about that like precious faith, the faith shared by all who obtained those great and precious promises. In verses 5 through 11, Peter encouraged us to be diligent in our efforts to make our call an election sure. We do that through continually improving our Christian quality so that we might never stumble, so that we might enter abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of Christ. Now, following up on this, he wrote these words. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. 2 Peter 1, verses 12 through 15. Now, Peter said that he was going to continually remind them of all of these things. Well, why would he do that? So that they would get to heaven. He said he was going to continue to remind them of these things, even though they knew the truth and they were firmly established in it. In fact, he was determined to make sure that they were going to be reminded of all of these things even after he was long gone. Well, how might we apply that to us today? Well, we are the same Christians as those Christians of long ago. We know the truth. We are established in our knowledge of the gospel. We know all these things, but we still need to hear them. And we need to hear them again and again and again. Why? So we won't stumble. So an entrance will be supplied to us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we will have what we need to make our call and election sure. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, Paul wrote, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Notice here that Paul said he had already preached the gospel to those in Corinth. They had already received it, and they were standing firm in it. He said that he continued to declare that very same gospel to them, even though they were Christians, even though they had already heard and received it. Now, both Peter and Paul both knew the value of continuing to declare the word of God even to those who are saved. When faithful preachers and teachers stand before us preaching those same old things, let us rejoice in their faithfulness. Let us praise them for their desire to walk in the old paths. Let us be thankful that they understand what we need to get to heaven. Let's be grateful that we are being reminded about sin, obedience, and what the Bible teaches about how we should live our lives, how we should be striving to be better Christians every day. Let us all have a great sense of relief that we are being guided by God's word and not by the wisdom of men. I'm thankful for this congregation, for our elders, for our preacher, for our teachers, for every one of you who work so hard to further the kingdom of Christ. You know, it's your desire to be people of the book which makes you a faithful congregation of the Lord's church. Now, also, sadly, many churches no longer even see a need to offer an invitation. 
They find the gospel invitation to be another one of those old things which should be tossed out as an embarrassment in today's modern, enlightened culture. Now imagine, imagine the Lord's Church no longer encouraging those who believe the gospel to repent of their sins, Acts 26 and verse 20, to confess the name of Jesus, Romans 10 and verse 9, or be immersed for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38 and 8.12. Now we, of course, should always remember that it was Peter who set our example at the end of the first recorded gospel sermon when he offered that first invitation, Acts 2, verse 38. If you have not yet put on your Lord in baptism, we stand ready to assist you this evening if that is your desire. If you're a Christian who for whatever reason needs the prayers of this congregation, we invite you to come right now while we stand and sing. There's a appreciate everyone coming out this evening for our midweek Bible study. We pray that your classes were edifying to you. Just to cover a few announcements uh, to close out uh, this evening, the ladies uh, game day afternoon is coming on Saturday the 11th uh, beginning at noon. It's going to be upstairs and ladies are encouraged to bring a bag, bag lunch and their favorite game and see Lileen Collins for details about that. And photo day is going to be taking place Sunday and that's for new members and those needing new photos. And that's uh, for pictures for our online directory. Uh, 
And you can see Ken and Jennifer Lowry for details about that. And our Ladies Digging Deep class will be held uh, Sunday at 3 p.m. Ms. Phyllis and Ms. Carroll have the details about that particular class. Connect group number five will meet Sunday evening uh, upstairs in the fellowship hall. And uh, Jason and Missy Givens have the details about uh, for that for connect group number five. And our men's monthly Bible study will take place Sunday via Zoom at 715. And all the men are encouraged to join. You can see Floyd for details about your Zoom link, about the Zoom link. And those of you who uh, know someone who, have, who, would, who could use cards of, a card of encouragement, uh, please fill out a connect card and put it in the box in the foyer. And uh, that'll get taken care of and see Larry for more details about that. And those who just recently graduated and have your information out there on the, in the foyer, um, if you didn't pick up your basket and gifts, please do so tonight. Uh, and if you cannot, um, they will be placed in the office and you'll be able to see Julie about that. And Vacation Bible School is coming up very quickly. So invite your friends and uh, you can use the Q QR code. That's, uh, <laughs> that's in the bulletin, so not the QVC code. That'll take you someplace else. Um, but yeah, the QR code, if you, want, if you would like to sign up for Vacation Bible School. And uh, our brother Daniel Jones would like to identify as a member here at Cary. Daniel, if you would take just a second to stand up. Our brother Daniel there. So please get to know him. And lastly, uh, second, uh, second, two more uh, prayer requests. Gene Osborne, Mr. Gene, he uh, was hospitalized with COVID and pneumonia, but he's at home uh, recovering. There's more details on the message board about that. And also our sister, uh, Dora Naylor, uh, she's hospitalized and uh, with kidney stones and the UTI. So let's remember Ms. Dora and Mr. Lee as he takes care of his wife and also their daughters too. Let's go to our Father in prayer as we close out for the evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to come and study your word, Father. We pray that our hearts and minds were open to the things that were presented this evening. We ask your richest blessing on the teachers who presented this evening. We also pray, Father, that they will continue to do the job that they're doing. And we ask you also, Father, to be with each member as we depart the building this evening, that we will glorify your name in everything that we do. For it's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. <laughs>